first, and now is the official BC Lions podcast. We are back inside the Wall Center, broadcasting inside the Go Goat Sports Studios, the Sakaris and Price Shrine, if you will. For those watching uh, the video, you see the first and now logos uh, behind us. A very good setup they've done for us all for just about a year now, Nick. Uh, Nick Kowalski uh, alongside uh, myself, Matt Baker, and... Uh, yeah, it's funny, reminiscing, our, remember our first one in here, I think we had Nathan Rourke on, did we not? First one in here, oh, I can't remember. It was last, I should remember. it was like a week or two before camp Nathan last was a, year? Nathan or? was after that, it had to be, Maybe right? it was Neil McAvoy the first time, but definitely one of those early ones. But The Nathan one was good though, I encourage people, our listeners, to go check it out. We, we talked stories about <laughs> his, um, his workout with the New York Giants, but as a receiver back then, so it was a good interview with Nathan. Yeah, that was, uh, his, that was during the 2020 CFL shutdown, I believe, after the draft, but at a point where there was going to be no CFL football played, and um, the, the New York Giants kind of called an audible, if you will. And yeah, I, he had some pretty strong words for how that workout went. <laughs> Of course, uh, only a small taste of what was to come because uh, in 2023, I guess starting in December 2022, I guess, he had a whole slew of NFL workouts and now is a member of the Jacksonville Jaguars. So uh, Nathan's uh, time uh, with the BC Lions was short. Who knows what the future might hold, but I wouldn't put anything past him in his efforts to crack a a roster in the National Football League on a full-time basis, but... Uh, on this episode, we're going to hear from someone who played a lot longer in Orange, uh, yeah. Paul McCallum. We're going to do a next little while. We're going to do a little bit of an alumni series, talk to some uh, prominent BC Lions alumni members. So we'll hear from Paul in just a few minutes. He, of course, fresh off his induct into, induction to the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in September. We talked to him around then, but um, no, that kind of that time in the schedule now where the news kind of few and far between. So. We're going to branch out and uh, reminisce a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be good to get some alumni guests on. And uh, we were doing our research on Paul this morning, too, and his, <laughs> his, his illustrious professional football career, both overseas, uh, in America and Canada. And um, yeah, we've got, we got some interesting st- stuff to tackle with Paul about his long professional career. Yeah, I mean, more to it than being pretty much second behind Louis Pisagli and all the Lions' major records as far as scoring field goals, converts. Uh, field goal percentage, he's right there, uh, hence the Hall of Fame recognition last year. Grey Cup champion with BC in 2006 and in 2011. Uh, there's a moment from that 2011 season, you think of starting 0-5 and the turnaround, you think of Travis Lule's emergence, you think of Arlan Bruce being acquired uh, mid-season pretty much, a huge shot in the arm for an offense that was struggling. Remember, Lule was in his first full year as a starter that campaign. But Paul McCallum, some pretty interesting heroics. Uh, he made a 53-yard field goal with no time left to beat Calgary in a game in early October. I think it was the second game at the renovated BC Place. Because remember, that half yeah. uh, September that year is when BC Place reopened after Empire Field, which we just drove by on our drive down here to the wall center. So that's a field goal. If, uh, if Paul doesn't make it, that's a team that ends up finishing third place. So Paul's stamp on that amazing story was significant. Big time. Yeah. And obviously a legendary career too. I think Chris Cuthbert had the call on that one. I think I never, I never putting together his, his wall of fame video. And there was like, I think Chris Cuthbert had the call. Or was it Rod Black? It was Rod Black. It was I Rod think, Black. TSN. Yeah. Uh, uh, a legendary TSN uh, broadcaster called it. Two legends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two t- w- one of the two, yeah. Yeah, two TSN legends. Uh, there's several, but yeah, that's right. Uh, and <laughs> funny story with that one. I was actually down in San Francisco uh, for a weekend uh, seeing uh, the 49ers play Tampa Bay, my first and only trip to Candlestick Park, the old Candlestick Park. And I was listening to that one on the Saturday night in my hotel room. This was... This was around the time smartphones were kind of new. So if you didn't do your research or if you didn't think about it, you you could get dinged on your roaming charges. Back in the day, yeah. Back in those days. No roam like home back then. Yeah, back so I I was in my hotel room, I think, and guess I wasn't on the Wi (laughs) Fi in whatever hotel I was staying at. It wasn't the nicest uh, hotel. It was a budget trip, Nick. I was I was still quite young and didn't have as, as much money as I do now. Still still don't have very much money, but that's <laughs> that. still don't have very Ca- much casual, money, but that's yeah. not uh that's not that's <laughs> not saying much. And 
got my cell phone bill like a couple of weeks later. Oh my God, what did I do in San Francisco? What was I doing? And, oh yeah, I, I was kind of streaming a, a live Lions game on my smartphone. But anyway, don't want to get off on too much of a tangent because we are going to take a deep dive with Paul. Uh, well-decorated football career. Still goes to many Lions games. And uh, again, we're going to be doing this for a few weeks is the plan. I talk to some significant alumni members and let our fans go down memory lane. It's always fun. Yep, looking forward to it. Very quickly, uh, there don't want to say there's no news, but uh, th- this was one we, we kind of knew about for a while. Uh, another global is coming to the den. Uh, John Levi Cruza is how you pronounce it. Fullback, long snapper. He's played a little tight end in the European Football League. Uh, the Lions selected John Levi in the third round of last year's global draft. He stayed in Hamburg in the European League for a year. And so that's going to be another global coming to Kamloops and maybe potentially uh, the Lions' next long snapper. We shall see. Yeah, there's another training camp battle to watch. There's a couple of guys yep. I know that have already been brought in that have long sna- or long snapping capabilities. And uh, uh, with with uh, John Levi Cruzal, he's got a kind of a wide range of skills. You see that he's caught touchdowns and and over in the European Football League, but he's also yeah can long snap, can play fullback too. Kind of comes to mind, the first guy that comes to mind in the recent CFL is maybe like a Nikola Kalinich, kind of that same kind of skill set, the way right. that Hamilton used him uh, before he departed to the NFL, actually. So, um, yeah, going to be interesting to see him in, in training camp this season and, and looking forward to, uh, to not only meeting him, but seeing him, uh, seeing him on the field and live in action. Stephen Chang talked to him as well. Yeah. Uh, said he's a very humble guy, and like a lot of CFL players, particularly the Europeans, an interesting off-the-field aspirations he's planning to be a mechanical engineer when football is done but and you and you said it another battle to watch uh tanner Dahl, the incumbent long snapper uh, was not re-signed in free agency in fact i don't think has been signed anywhere yet uh love tanner Dahl. every long snapper you meet's a great guy tanner Dahl. uh we had mike benson here before then yeah, just just down to earth, and uh, it'll be interesting to see who emerges from that battle. But Stephen Chang going to have a, a five things to know feature on Mr. Levi Cruza, potentially at the end of this week. So another one to look forward to. Yep, and we also have Vernon Adams Jr. coming to town this week too. So we're going to be documenting. I can't I can't really drop too much or, or reveal too much about what we're doing with Vernon Adams Jr. in the coming weeks, but uh, some really exciting content to come with. Um, with the team too, it's not just Vernon that we're keying on, but there's going to be, um, I guess, camaraderie would be the key, the yeah. key topic that's going to be featured on these upcoming pieces. And looking forward to that and seeing VA this week up in Surrey. There will be plenty of uh, VA content to come between now and May the tenth when players start reporting to Thompson Rivers University. And yeah, um, he's pretty much here one week out of every month, so it's convenient. He's living just down the I five a couple hours away in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, Subscribe, rate, leave, and review, as always, on uh, First and Now. We'll talk with Paul McCallum, a Canadian Football Hall of Fame inductee, Grey Cup champion a couple times in BC, all kinds of accolades coming up next on First and Now. And it's our pleasure now to uh, have number four in your program, formerly number four in your program for all those years, uh, Surrey Rams, BC Lions, Scottish Claymores, uh, the Las Vegas. Why am I drawing a blank, Paul? The Las oh, Vegas Outlaws. Outlaws, yes. Yeah. Let's see, it's over not two. The po- not, not the posse. Not the posse. <laughs> not that we know of. Who knows? Maybe there's a media guide in there that states you attended a mini camp or something. We, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't <laughs> know about it. But uh, yeah, it's over two decades ago, and we'll get into all that XFL stuff, but um, it's a pleasure to have you here on First and Now, uh, your podcast debut here. Great to have you aboard. And yeah. uh, how's life these days? Uh, real estate must be picking up post-pandemic, huh? Uh, it's it's uh, it's taken its time. I mean, uh, unfortunately, with uh, the inflation and the interest rates and things like that, it's uh, it's taken a little longer than I'd like it to. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, diving into some commercial real estate. Uh, ventures that I, uh, you know, I started commercial when I was in Saskatchewan. So I've picked that up a little bit more here lately, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm doing okay. Was this always the post football plan for you, Paul? Uh, Yeah, it was. Uh, When I was in Saskatchewan, um, Jason Claremont and I were roommates and uh, 
you know, I started to, to read some books uh, and then he decided to do the same thing. But uh, yeah, I, I picked it up in Saskatchewan uh, doing commercial real estate in 04. And uh, that was kind of what I planned on doing. And then uh, was it uh, 2011, actually, I was, I was booking showings after Grey Cup, like for two days. So the morning of Grey Cup, I was, I was booking showings and things like that. So, uh, yeah, no, this was what I've been doing it ever, like ever since 2004. You're probably well rested for those showings, right? Uh, yeah, no, I, well, I, I gave myself two days to recover. So um, <laughs> I, I was, I was, it was about, it was about enough time for me. There you go. Uh, 2011 uh, was a great year indeed. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that shortly here. But uh, you, it's been coming up on seven years, I think, since your retirement. People forget you actually came out of retirement at the end yeah. of that 2016 campaign when uh, Richie was struggling a little bit. But uh, is it hard to believe it's been that long or has it flown by for you, Paul? It's just flown by. Um, I can remember the whole... Uh... The whole story and, and, and a quick, a quick uh, story on how it happened was the last game that uh, Saskatchewan played in Taylor Field was against the Lions, and I had called the Lions and asked if I could maybe jump on the plane. I'll pay for a ticket, whatnot. And they're like, no business trip, no, no other people are coming on. And I was like, okay, fine, because I just wanted to go and come back. I ended up uh, took myself to the game. I was up in the in the media box actually, play by play box with uh, Saskatchewan Premier and. What not? We were, we had a couple of drinks, and uh, um, unfortunately, Richie missed a field goal just before halftime. And um, I came out at half, and Neil was walking down the hallway, and I was kind of giving him the gear, saying, "You know, you're going into the playoffs. I don't think Richie's comfortable. You need to go and get someone else." And I think I was, uh, oh my goodness, I can't think of his name right now. Um, anyway, he used to kick in Toronto. I said, "I think he's available. You should go get him." And anyway, the morning, the next morning. Uh, I'm pulling up to my house and the phone rings and I'm like, what does Neil want? You know, maybe there's something wrong with the house that I just sold him. And he just said, uh, so uh, what are you doing next week? <laughs> thought he was joking. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I came out of retirement. Yeah, that was, uh, I remember that well too, because uh, it was, was my first year with the team, was on that trip. It was uh, one of those Operation Orange deals where it actually was a, a full charter. So you would have had to go in like the luggage compartment or something. Yeah, but I yeah. remember, I'll never forget, though, the Monday back in the office, it was uh, Jamie Cartmel, the previous communications director, just came up to me and said, uh, you ready to be stunned? I'm like, well, what's going on now? We're bringing back Paul McCallum. And that's so that was kind of the story <laughs> of that week going into the playoffs. Good times indeed. Yeah, yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, uh, I never said anything at the time, but Neil said, you know, have you been kicking? And I was like, she oh, yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> and the only kicking that I had been doing is I'd been, uh, I'd never actually, from the time I, um, the, well, earlier in the year, I guess, the year before, it's the last time I kicked a football and I was only uh, at my daughter's soccer practices and everything like that. So um, I knew I could do it, but it was funny because uh, I hadn't kicked a ball in over a year. So it was, uh, I didn't tell them that till after, but it was all good. <laughs> <laughs> and and Paul, with, with the BC Lions uh, kicker and punting position now, or kicker position now, um, Sean White returned last season, and um, he's someone that you were familiar with being teammates back back in the early or the early two thousands or in two thousand and ten range. Um, yeah. how, but how happy were you to see Sean uh, come back to BC and uh, and don don the orange and black again? Yeah, no, I was happy for him. I mean. Uh, you know, both being BC boys and growing up, you know, you want to play for your home team. And, you know, he, he kind of had to do the same thing I did. You know, when Louis was here, I had to go elsewhere. And when I was here, he had to go elsewhere. But, you know, to be able to come home and play in front of your, your family, um, it is special. It's nice and things like that. So I was happy for him. Back when you guys were, were teammates in the 2008 to, to 14 range there, what, what was that relationship like? Because he's been on the record too to say, saying that um, he knew he wasn't going to see the field as long as you were a dual kicker punter, but was he there Was he there still learning from you or pushing you in, in, in practice or what was that whole dynamic like? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, early on when Sean first came around, it was, you know, I was trying to help him and things like that. But, uh, you know, he's a very confident person and, and uh, you know, it turned into more of a competition and, you know, me being the old guy having to keep, uh, keeping with the young kid at bay. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, we're both competitive people. So that's what it, it was just business. 
Is there any is there any good stories you have of a young Sean White? Because he's a he's a fun, he's a, fun, he's, a he's a fun guy to talk to even now. But I'm sure you yeah. have something or that you can, some some that you can air. PG of course, yeah. yeah. PG, yeah. I was just thinking. There's a lot of them I can't tell you. Um, let me think. Um, one of the one of the games. Um, what happened was I'm not sure if you remember this. And Neil, Neil will never forget it because Neil forgot to change Sean and I. Um, I got hurt, so I was on the um, the injured list for I don't know however many games. And then when it was time for me to come back off the injured list and, and start playing again, it was at Empire in 2011. Um, I'm uh, you know I warm up and uh, I'm uh, you know getting ready to start the game, and I think the other team kicked off, and uh, you know we are second and long. And Farhan comes up to me and he says, you can't play. I go, what are you talking about? I can't play. And he just goes, just a minute. He's listening to, I guess, the TV broadcast in his ear. And he's like, uh, yeah, you can't play. He said, apparently you're not on the roster. You're still on IR. And um, so they were racing around for Sean um, and uh, trying to find him, I guess, get him, get him ready and suit up because he had to play. So, you know, Cato's looking at me, I need your equipment. And I'm like, yeah, no, um, it's, <laughs> it's my, my tailored equipment. It's just one of those things. Right. So, um, yeah, Sean, I guess what happened was I was all my, all my pants, my Jersey, everything was tailored. And, uh, he had been wearing his own stuff, you know, while he was playing. And then what happened was, uh, he wanted, he wanted my pants. He said, Cato came up and said, Sean wants your pants. I said, Sean's not getting my pants. <laughs> I guess I pissed him off, but uh, it was kind of funny. We had a bit of a, a little bit of a disagreement back then on that. But yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting thing. I, I, you know, I, and I said to Neil jokingly, I said, if I miss out on any bonuses because you screwed up their roster, I'm taking it out on you. And it was it was pretty it was pretty it was unusual. I mean, <laughs> Neil will never do that again. That's for sure. <laughs> Baptism yeah. by fire, as they say, is uh, for for Neil. Among others. Um, So it's funny how it all goes full circle. I mean, you obviously were a a mentor to Sean White. You came in in the early 90s when you were still with the Surrey Rams practicing with the team. And there was uh, that Pasaglia guy here um, who wasn't going anywhere for a while. And ultimately, you had to go somewhere else to carve out your career as a pro. But um, when you went into the Hall of Fame, you told this story uh, in your Zoom media press conference, Paul. There was a great story about going out with Louie. And now uh, let's uh, be honest, having a bit of a late night and having to show up to practice in the morning. And <laughs> Louie taught you a valuable lesson. Uh, explain to our listeners what you learned that day. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, uh, you know, I, I just was doing what I was told. And uh, Louie and I went out and we went out and had a a couple drinks, I guess you could say, or a few. And, uh, I, uh, I might've had more than he did because I, I sure felt it. But anyway, the next morning, um, you know, I get up to practice and, you know, I might've been at the tail end of all the players getting on the field. And, and I look and Louis is absolutely drenched, soaked because he had been running and uh, he's on the far end of the field. And then when I sort of sauntered on, he just ran up to me or I, we, we, we met on the side or whatever it was. And he just looked at me and he just said, start running. And I was like, are you kidding me? He goes, no, 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 no. He said, if you're going to come out and, 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 and have fun and play and everything else, you're going to pay. He said, so start running. And I'm like, you're kidding. He says, nope. So anyway, I, back then I just did as I was told, you know, it wasn't the coach, it was Lou. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where he's one of the hardest working guys, um, you know, everything was business and uh, you could very, very competitive. You could see even when uh, he would play racquetball, because back in the day where the storage is uh, in the facility, those, those racquetball courts were used for racquetball, not storage. And so, yeah. you know, any kind of competition, he's focused. So um, yeah, it's just one of those things I learned from him from way back when is if you're going to go and have fun, uh, better be prepared to go work twice as hard the next morning. That is a great story. Um, and, you know, Louis got that Italian blood in him, so he's able to burn the candle at both ends probably too. No different than Scottish blood in a way, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
2011, uh, we, we've talked th- this about you before. I mean, um, one of the wins I'll always remember during that great turnaround was the Calgary game. I think it was the second game back at the renovated dome. Um, yeah. 53 yarder with no time left to beat the Stampeders. And he ended up beating Calgary on a tiebreaker for first place at the end of the year. So no debating how big that kick was. But did you have to talk Wally into letting you go out there and kick that one? How did that work? No, I've told I've told this story, and actually, funny enough, I didn't realize, but Wally's told the story. Um, you know, uh, hitting people people don't realize this, but there is a bit of a breeze in the stadium, and hitting it one way or the other can make a difference. And uh, anyway, um, I had just missed I had just missed a long kick uh, prior to that, and uh, Larry Taylor ran it all the way back for a touchdown to go up by two, I think it was. And uh, so then we got the ball back and Travis got us uh, within range. And for me, I thought we were within range. And so I just started walking on the field. And Wally, had, he's always about five years on the field. And uh, he didn't really look at me. He just kind of had his hand up and he was waving me off as if to say, well, we might go for this on a Hail Mary or something. But I, I just waved him off and I just kept walking. And then he looked at me and I kept walking and he kind of, all right, it's on your shoulders, and and off I went. So I, you know, I always tell the story where I waved Wally off and went out. But uh, yeah, it was good that I made it. For, that's for sure. When it comes to kicks like those, uh, we talked to Sean about this this past season. He had to hit a game winner at Calgary last season. But when when you're in the field and you and you know it's it's the final play of the game, and you're either going to win the game or lose the game. Like, do you remember what's going through your mind in those moments? Is is the pressure actually hitting you, or are you just thinking I got to kick this ball as hard as I can? No, I mean, it's really hard to describe. For me, um, I always just, I always would be just getting me in range and, and, you know, I'd be looking at the clock and looking at the score and, uh, you know, I would run up to the special teams coach and I would say, look, you know, get me this close, get me that close. And I, I just, you know, relished having the opportunity to, to do that. Um, it's, uh, it's just uh, something that's, I always wanted, when I was playing soccer as a kid growing up, I'd always tell the coach, you know, either put me first or put me last. Um, and I enjoyed being last. Uh, I ran into a couple of guys that uh, I played uh, juvenile soccer growing up, youth soccer, and they always remembered the, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a longer story, but I uh, got to go play in the club national championship. And uh, I had the last kick, um, the penalty kicks to win the national championship. And I stood there. And I stood there, and in my head, I was waiting to sort of psych the goalie out by just not going and just stood there because I knew I was going to make it. And then I went up and I kicked it. And uh, I remember the coach coming up to me and saying, what the hell were you doing? You were taking so long. He goes, were you freaked out, nervous? And I go, no. He goes, I was trying to psych the goalie out. I just wanted to make him nervous. And he's, he just looked at me. So I guess it's just the type of person I am. I just relished having that opportunity. Um, we've talked a lot about your CFL accolades and, uh, gray cups, but, uh, you made a couple other interesting stops along the way. Talk just now about your soccer history too, but, uh, 1996, you were with the Scottish Claymores and, uh, won a world bowl, the world league of American football. I think that was called, yeah. um, what was that whole experience like? And, and how big was that maybe compared to winning gray cups or other championships in North America? Uh, you know what, for me, it was a, a completely different experience. Um, my whole family, um, well, my mom's got four brothers, four sisters, and the two girls, the two boys lived in Glasgow and where I was living and playing from, playing out of, and the other, the other uh, two and two lived in Canada. So for me, you know, I was going to practice and I could go hang out with my cousins that, you know, I never really grew up with. Um, but uh, so from that perspective, it was it was it was something special. Um, and then the football, it was just um, it, it, it was interesting because there's a lot of, you know, British people that really love. They call it American football. Um, and uh, to go over there and see the excitement and, and everything else, it was it was really it was special. And the, and the group of guys that we had, uh, the format was real different. If you won the first, I think it was before the first five games then um, you all automatically get to host it. 
so we already knew we we had a pretty strong team so we had to to host it but uh yeah it was it was special and uh you know um another interesting story is i, I still remember today was the june june 23rd was the um the world bowl in 1996 and saskatchewan's first home opener was june 22nd Hmm. And then Jim Daly, I remember calling me, telling me that I can just miss the miss miss the World Bowl and come. I need to come back, and I just had to remind him. I said, "You realize I'm not under contract, so you know, I'll sign that when I get home." But <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was it was real special. I got to hit. Uh, I think it was the first 50 yard field goal in, uh, in the World Bowl, um, and uh, yeah, no, we won the game, and uh, yeah, we. we we got to the airport, and I think there's four of us that had to fly all the way to, you know, Washington, Seattle, like uh, Seattle, Washington, or Vancouver. And we got to the airport, and uh, I think I, I think I actually told the person that we were supposed to be upgraded to first class, and <laughs> some, somehow it happened. So we get to fly all the way from uh, Scotland all the way back to Vancouver and Seattle in first class, but yeah. It's quite the trip. Winning a World Bowl title, I would hope they would they would roll out the red carpet. I mean, first well, class caviar on the on the flight home. Yeah, I might have bent somebody's ear, but it worked, and you know it was comfortable flight home because we were a little bit uh, tired to say the least. Yeah, on the coming home, but it was good. A lot of fun, a lot of fun memories, and I still talk to some guys to this day in Scotland and uh, in Seattle. Um, for for a duck, it's one of the guys. Um, and believe Kari, Kahari Jones was on that team. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, long time ago. Small football world, no matter where you're playing. Um, you're also the answer to a trivia question here. I'm sure you know this. Uh, we have you as the only player in league history, CFL history, to play against the Ottawa Rough Riders, the Ottawa Renegades, and the Ottawa Red Blacks. Um, and, pl- and, and, and played for the Ottawa Rough Riders. And you did play for the Ottawa Rough Riders back in, in the early 90s. That's correct. Yeah. What uh, I mean, what are some of those? One of some of the memories there. I mean, the franchise obviously wasn't always on solid ground, hence why they seized operations after 1996. But uh, what are some of the memories of playing for and against each of those Ottawa franchises? Uh, well, interesting enough, my first game for Ottawa was against Winnipeg, and I was uh, it was my first professional game where I was actually punting the ball. And uh, it was cold and windy, and uh, I think my very first punt might have gone 12 yards. <laughs> and and Bob Cameron came up to me because I went. I didn't go in at halftime. I just was out practicing, trying to kick into the wind. And Bob Cameron came out a little earlier, and he, he you know basically said, "Hey kid, just uh, just so you know, don't feel bad. My first punt went backwards, like the other way." Um, but then he just, he told me what uh, what he thought I should do as far as you know tilting the ball down, gave me some pointers, and uh, made a huge difference. Um, but uh, there was there was that was there was that, and then the other memory would be um, I think because I was playing with Saskatchewan at the time, and uh, they we had had a terrible season the season before, and so. The Renegades just came into the league and they put us against them um, for the season opener. And what had happened was, you know, I, I had just signed back with Saskatchewan and Eric Tillman was trying to get me to come to Ottawa and he offered me a huge contract, which I did take because he was, hand, he was throwing the money away. But anyway, um, so we played them and then I kicked a 40, I kicked a 48 yarder to tie the game with no time left on the clock. And then over time, I kicked the 55 yarder to win it. That was their very first game against the Renegades. And I got to kick the winners against them. And when, when Matt was going uh, with trivia wrote that, that last question, I thought you, you were going to bring up the XFL uh, trivia that you were the first person to score uh, points in league history in the inaugural season in 2001. But um, when you, when you think of the Las Vegas outlaws, like what's the first thing that pops into your head? Oh boy. <laughs> we're talking about Las Vegas, yeah. Um, the, an interesting thing was um, Darcy Dolan, who he played for the Riders for a few games um, until I went there. Uh, 
And then, uh, anyway, I met him when I went down to Vegas. I found out he was there. He invited me to uh, some friend's house, uh, a friend's house to watch the Super Bowl. And during, during training camp that we were having down there, because training camp was in February. And uh, they were from Montreal. And camp was just about coming to an end. And we were out looking for places to live. And, uh, you know, they were asking, Darcy's asking me, and I was talking about it. And anyway, this couple, I was driving home after the, the game. And uh, the couple called me and said, look, if you need, you can, if you need a place for a week or two or whatever, um, you can come and stay with us. They lived in a gated community. They backed onto a golf course. I mean, they had the pool and the hot, like it was, it was beautiful. So anyway, um, I also never took a, I took a car down there. And then Darcy introduced me to a, a, a friend whose father owned an exotic car rental place. So I was paying, I think it was four hundred dollars a month to live in this beautiful, beautiful house on a golf course, and I was paying twelve dollars a day, and I was driving a Porsche Boxster convertible, hmm. living the life down there. And uh, I'll admit this, but I was expecting my second child, and my um, my ex wife now, she did not want to come to Vegas to have her to have her child. So she stayed in Saskatchewan, uh, minus 30 to 32 degree weather. And uh, I was flying in, you know, my mother, her friends and everybody while I was in Vegas. So anyway, I come home after the season. I did go, I did go home uh, to see, see my daughter. But uh, when I came home after the season, I never, I had a friends of mine come over who had come to Vegas and they were showing pictures to me and my wife at the time was sitting beside me and she, you know, obviously I'm not going to tell her that I'm driving around on a Porsche all the time and whatnot. Um, so she's looking at these photos and there's pictures of me and my buddies in these poor like convertibles on Harleys. And she's like, Oh, okay. I'm in Saskatchewan giving birth to your kids and raising your kids and you're in Las Vegas living. There. And I'm like, Hey, look, you could have calmed down. You said no. So what do you want me to say? No, I better not drive that Porsche because my <laughs> wife will be upset. Give me, give me a, a, you know, a station wagon. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's the first thing that comes to mind um, from a non-football um, part. But the other thing would be um, Sam Boyd Stadium. We sold it out for the inaugural game when, you know, when Vince McMahon did the whole, you know, this is not the NFL and whatnot. And uh, I gave the tickets to my, you know, my roommates. And uh, he told me that he was offered walking through the door $700 a ticket for these tickets. I was like, jeepers. Like, it, it, it was um, there because there was no professional football there other than us when we were, when, uh, we were there. We'd walk into any nightclub, any establishment. And if they knew, you know, you played for the – the outlaws, you were, you know, you were treated as if you're an NFL player, or, you know, mm -hmm. like it was, it was pretty, and there's lots to do down there. I, I, I would live there tomorrow, um, but you don't have to go near the strip. I really like it down there. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting mm -hmm. to say the least. As, as far as your teammates that season, um, the, the starting running back for the for the Outlaws was Rod Smart, uh, famously he, known as He Hate Me. He Hate Me. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what was Rod like by, during that season? Oh, he was, he was hilarious. Um, he came, we were all sitting in the trainer's room in the hotel during training camp when uh, we had just had a meeting and they had said, you can put whatever you want on the name bar. So then we're in the training room and their guys are saying, well, you know, what are you going to do? Excuse me. And, uh, you know, Rod, Rod had his saying and then they were saying to me that they they wanted me to put laces out on the back of my jersey, and they wanted me to kick an extra point, go out, um, like and do the replacements. They wanted me to kick an extra point with a cigarette in my mouth, right? I was like, yeah. oh, no, no, no. I, I still, at that point, still wanted to try and go to the NFL. I thought, no, there's, you know, we 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 don't want this clown. So, but we would we were walking through an airport. I can't remember which airport it was, and it was a woman's, like I think it was like. University of Georgia's women's track and field team started walking past us and they recognized him and they stopped him and they're asking for his autograph. And 
you know, the, the guys, the rest of the guys are making fun of him and everything, but he was loving it. But he was, he had a really good, good sense of humor, that guy. It, uh, well, probably still does, but yeah, he was just full of fun. The replacements. That was the Welsh kicker, right? That did that with yes. the cigarette in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. The Keanu yeah. Reeves is the quarterback. Yeah. Underrated. Underrated. Yeah. Uh, Gene Hackman was the coach, I think, right? Yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nick, check it out. I know you're that's before your time. I've but... seen it. I've seen oh, it. Oh, you've seen it. I okay. Get that reference. All right. yeah. I love it. Um, hey Paul, listen, uh, this was fun. It's always fun, but uh even more fun when we can sort of branch out and uh and go down memory lane. Um, congratulations again on uh, the Hall of Fame. I know we were, we were proud to cover that, uh, seeing you actually go to Hamilton this year. The Lions didn't go to Hamilton in 2022, but we always oh. tr- we go up there and we we pay tribute to all the Lion busts, so we'll be happy to see yours. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, uh, I got a photo of uh, Louie's bust up there. I think I, I think I did a selfie with it as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, from from late nights at camp to side by side bus, it's a that's a great story in itself. Uh, thanks as always, Paul, and uh, we'll be sure to catch up. Oh, before we, one more <coughs> thing, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, bring this up. You still go to a lot of the games, and I hear you enjoy uh, the Den, the Truly Den. Is that correct? Yes, I actually have two booths up there, and uh, yeah. So actually, I'm, I'm I haven't done anything formally, but I'm I'm looking to do something here, you know, to promote obviously my real estate business, but, uh, you know, to maybe take some fans up, um, you know, I've got, uh, like I said, I've got eight seats in the den and, uh, this year I might be getting another four on the sideline. I went down there and those seats are pretty, pretty awesome. It's a, it's an experience. I think that all fans should, should experience, um, being that close to the players on the sideline and to the game to, to, to see how fast it is and, uh, you know, how hard some of those hits are. It's a, uh, it's a lot different than sitting up, uh, high. So, you know, I'm thinking about doing some uh, promotional work with the team and, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see some, some more fans, uh, in, in the seats, hopefully this year. And hopefully I can bring some. Anything we can do to help, uh, you know, where to find us. That's awesome to hear Paul. Appreciate it guys. Thanks again. Thanks Paul. All right. Thanks guys. Paul McCallum, always a pleasure to talk to Paul, one of the good guys in this league that this franchise was lucky to employ. A couple different stints. Members started here, but at that point didn't seem like Louis Pasaglia was going anywhere anytime soon. No different than Sean White, really. When the with connection Paul. is yeah. yeah, the connection is crazy. Like Sean yeah. White came here in 08, 07, territorial exemption, whenever it was, and this McCallum guy is quite the ageless kicker. Sean as well had to go carve out a niche in Montreal, and then uh, spent the meat of his career in Edmonton before coming home. And, and we have Sean for a couple of more years. He's one of those two-year extended guys yeah. ahead of free agency. So love talking with Paul. Yeah. Sean just didn't go to Scottsdale and didn't go play in Las Vegas with He Hate Me. And, <laughs> but yeah, one of the most probably maybe yeah. interesting football paths out there for Paul McCallum. I know he was like the, the stat that he was the only he's the only CFL player too to play against the Ottawa Red Blacks, the Ottawa Renegades and the Ottawa Rough Riders. That's another interesting stat that just goes to the Paul McCallum's legacy. And we hit on it with him. I mean, going into a game in Ottawa say in the late 90s or you know the early 2000s, not quite as uh, lively and hip and cool as it is right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ottawa Red Blacks games are fun. It feels like the place to be. What they've done with that brand is outstanding. And it's just a shame we don't go there this year so, due to the the unbalanced schedule. But we'll make up for that uh, in Montreal, Toronto, and Hamilton. The Eastern trip's always fun. Sean White, Bayside Rugby, has experience there as a rugby player. And we chronicled some of this himself. And uh, Manny Rugamba were... Learning some tricks as far as rugby goes from the Sevens squad, and you can catch that at bclions.com. Both you and I were at the Sevens. We were both there on Friday with a group of co-workers in, in our team suite. Thank you, Mr. Doman. Um, and I was back there on Saturday helping out with a little of the uh, the interviews that the players are doing on the field. 
and uh, spent some time upstairs uh, meeting some sponsors as well. Always good to do that. Uh, what did you think of your first Rugby Sevens event? Different, it was, huh? It was neat. It yeah. was neat. I, I actually kind of went in blind. I didn't really know the costumes aspect was a thing, so we had some costumes up in our suite for some, oh, some yeah. of the co-workers. That's uh, the thing. You dress up for it. Yeah, yeah, make it a whole event. I saw, even on social media, I saw their posts where they had, like, a best of costumes. There was, there was guys in, like, a Woody, uh, a Woody, uh, a co- oh, there was about 10 of them in that from the, from Toy Story. Right. Um, but, yeah, the, on Friday, the Canada, the Canada, or the Canadian men, they ended the game with a big upset over Australia. So that was a Friday neat. night. That, that, that was, was the last match on Friday, yeah. That, that was fun to see. Definitely ended on a high note. And it was just cool seeing all the athletes, too, from the pretty much countries across the world, too. 14-minute matches, so you can see. Quick, yeah. yeah. And so that was the last one Friday. Uh, the last one I saw, I had to jet on Saturday around middle of the day because I was there early in the morning. I saw Canada take down Chile on Saturday. That was similar. There was more people in there, I think, at that point. So it was a big boost, eh? Yeah. 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 I think it was Ireland that won it all, right? I think. I think the Argentina men was it? Yeah. Australia got bronze. Yeah, great research. <laughs> we yeah. do always. Yeah, good podcast. Talk. I thought I saw something about Argentina. Maybe, I thought I saw our, a picture, sorry, I Ireland. Thought I saw a picture of Argentina. Of Ireland. Why, uh... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Show look prep, it up. Show prep it up. is you're, always if you're key. Listening, yeah. yeah, if you're listening, look it up. We we just went and had fun and, and had a couple of diet Pepsis and just enjoyed some coworkers' took, took company. Some pic- took some pictures, yeah. Yeah. Right, you guys, yeah. Thank you so much to you, the listeners, by the way, for always tuning in. I could talk with Paul McCallum all day, and uh, stay tuned. Uh, we have another alumni member, big one, significant one to talk about, and some significant accolades, too, to discuss Hopefully yeah. on next week's episode. He is at Nick underscore Kowalski on Twitter. I am at Bakes Takes 84. The podcast is at First and Now. And we'll talk to you next week. Until next time. Be good out there. <laughs>